Old Testament reading today comes from the 24th chapter of the book of Exodus. Listen now for the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again. For Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson today comes from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Listen once again for the word of the Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The story of the Transfiguration is a story in which Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain where the four of them were alone. Why just these three, we don't know. But there was no Philip, no Andrew, no Thomas, no Judas, nor anyone else. Just Peter, James, and John. And as they were up on this mountain together, something odd happened. Jesus' face started shining like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white, as it says in the NRSV, where his clothes became as white as light, as another translation says. Out of the blue, Moses and Elijah also appeared there with Jesus, and they were talking with him. So Peter finally spoke in the midst of all this, and he said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you want, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while Peter was still talking, Suddenly a bright cloud came over them, and from the cloud there was a voice which said, This is my son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The three disciples were frightened by this voice, as I feel sure that I would be too, and they fell to the ground trembling. But then they felt Jesus touch them and say, Get up and don't be afraid. And at that time, the disciples noticed that Moses and Elijah were now gone. No one was left but Jesus. 
And then as they were coming down the mountain, out of this strange scene, something even stranger happened. Jesus said to the three disciples, Tell no one about this until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Say nothing about this until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now, if you find all this a little confusing this morning, I want to tell you that you're not alone. Your pastor also finds it confusing. Why are the disciples told not to tell anyone about this? What's the big secret? We can guess why Jesus says this, and maybe some good reasons come to mind. Maybe Jesus thought that people would misunderstand this event if they didn't first know about the resurrection. Or maybe he thought that the story would somehow be a distraction for people as he headed to the cross. Or maybe he thought if people knew about it, something could happen to him which would interfere with his plans to go to the cross. But we just don't know. For whatever reason, Jesus says, tell no one until after I have been raised from the dead. Keep this a secret until I have been raised from the dead. I know of a couple named Becca and Rodney. Becca and Rodney were dating for a long time, and they finally got engaged. And once they were engaged, Becca let Rodney in on a terrible secret that she'd been hiding for a long time. You see, she had the eating disorder of bulimia, and she had had it for years. She'd had it ever since she was a teenager when she first worried about her body image. As a bulimic, Becca would eat like a normal person, but then she would go into the bathroom and throw up in order to avoid gaining any weight. Now, Becca saw a doctor about her problem, and she was treated for it. And it was not so severe that her health was in danger, but it was something that she always struggled with, something she constantly struggled with. For years, she had avoided telling Rodney about this because she worried that he would stop loving her if he knew or even look at her differently. But now she was at the point in their relationship where she trusted Rodney a lot enough to let him in on their secret, feeling that she knew him well enough now that he would not hurt her. Well, it so happened that Rodney had a cousin who was also bulimic. His cousin had also been ashamed to tell anyone about her secret, but she finally got the courage to come forward and tell her church and even join a support group, and she found great healing in that. Once she shared her story, Rodney's cousin was amazed at how many people surrounded her with love and acceptance, and who even told her that they had the same disorder, people she would never imagine telling her they had this disorder. Well, Rodney thought that Becca would also find the same healing in coming forward. So one day, the phone rang. A stranger's voice was on the other end. And as Becca started talking, she found out this was a counselor who led a group therapy session about eating disorders, who thought that Becca might be interested in coming in. Becca was crushed. Rodney tried to explain to her that he was just trying to help Becca by telling her secret. But he didn't seem to understand that in her mind, it wasn't his secret to tell. Becca's trust in Rodney was shattered and his betrayal of her would end their relationship. No matter who you are in life, you eventually come to a point where there is something in your life that you don't want everybody to know about. In fact, there might be something in your life that you don't want anyone to know about. But if you are blessed enough to have a friend or someone to love, you might have someone in your life that you trust enough to let them in on your secret. And that is a sacred trust. 
And part of being a friend or a fiancé or being a spouse is knowing just what a sacred thing it is that you've been entrusted with, when you've been entrusted with such a secret. And here's the thing. As the person who's been entrusted with this secret, you may believe that the person you care about will be better off if they share this information with other people. In fact, you may even know that they'll be better off. But to be a friend is to know that even if your friend would be better off if they shared their secret, for you to share it for them would mean that you are no longer a friend. Or you may be a fiancé or a spouse to the person you care about. But if you would share their secret for any reason, you aren't a faithful fiancé or a faithful spouse. For most of my life, I have grown up believing that everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ should be proclaimed as loudly as possible to as many people as possible. I can remember when I was a teenager, my friend Chris, who was a Southern Baptist, would often take me as a guest to his Baptist youth group that met every week. I liked the Baptist youth group. I liked them a lot. They had all the cookies you could eat and all the lemonade you could drink. But every week when we sat around in a circle, they wanted to know just how many people that you witnessed to this week. That is, how many people did you tell about Jesus? And they would always start with Shirley Mae Blackman. That was her name, Shirley Mae. And Shirley Mae would always have some astronomical number of people she told Jesus about, like 12 or 13 people or something like that, every week. And then they would always get around to me and they'd say, how many people did you tell Jesus about this week, Rich? And I'd say, zero. <laughs> and they'd say, come again, it sounds like you said zero. And I'd say, that's what I said. Same number as last week. Well, in spite of the cookies and lemonade, after doing that for a few weeks, I got a little tired of going to the Baptist youth group. And I decided I would stick with the Presbyterian youth <laughs> who didn't care so much how many people I told Jesus about, although I'm not sure that's a good thing. But all my life, all my life I've been told that the things we learn about God and Jesus are things that we ought to go out proclaiming. Proclaiming to everyone. The last thing Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew is go into all the world. Go into all the world, baptizing people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And that, I believe, is the way it should be for the most part. As we know from hearing terrible stories about sexual abuse in the church, Secrets in the church can be dangerous. Priests and pastors who've been looked at as speaking for God have turned to adults and children that they have abused and said, don't tell anyone about this. This is our secret. So let me give you two quick rules about secrets. First, no one who is in the clergy no one who is in the clergy should ever ask a parishioner that they're serving to keep a secret. Never. And second, no one who has ever harmed you ever has a right to ask you to keep your harm a secret. Never. But with these two things aside, with these two things aside, if you have ever had wounds or scars or shame, that you don't know what the whole world to know about. If you've ever had something about yourself you did not want the whole world to know about, isn't it good to know that sometimes God is the same way? I don't know why that helps so much, but I think it does. If you've ever suffered, there's something healing about knowing that in Christ, God has suffered too. If you've ever been lonely or rejected, there's something healing in knowing that in Christ, God too has been lonely and rejected. And if you've ever had a secret, if you've ever had something in your life that you don't want the whole world to know about for whatever reason, then for whatever reason, 
and reasons maybe we can't fully understand. In Christ, God has secrets too. And that is the story of the Transfiguration. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.